So last session we went through the last of the uh, supernatural witnesses, David Whitmer, the most interviewed. Uh, we then spent a little bit of time on this uh, unique theory of uh, Brody and Dan Vogel and others that um, Joseph had, an, in some cases, uh, Brody says unconscious, uh, but positive talent at hypnosis, and Vogel would say that it was, um, uh, it was conscious, he was trying to hypnotize people. Uh, we talked through the conclusions of, of that um, as follows, that uh, both of these uh, scholars only use four sources of evidence for uh, positing some sort of subjective or trance-like experience, and they were all actually just of Martin Harris um, and ignore all other statements which are contradicted by more than 100 other statements by the witnesses. So when you take their statements in totality, you don't get anything like those, those four. Um, we said that they didn't offer any evidence for how Joseph uh, learned or trained hypnosis prior to the word even being invented, right? First studies come out in 1840 about hypnosis. Um, so it's before it even uh, gets going in the, in the laboratory, in the classroom. We talked about how there was no evidence offered for Joseph ever trying or failing in this uh, process. Um, and there was no evidence offered for the ability of any trained hypnotist to induce similar experiences. We talked about the complex uh, audio, visual nature of them, and sometimes they, they felt things. Uh, they were all corresponding in nature, whereas uh, this would be a feat that would be unknown uh, to us in, in hypnosis. And apparently he's doing so uh, prior to um, the, the rise of the of this, the study of hypnosis. Um, so I argued that prior to shifting the burden of proof to apologists, uh, critics uh, have s needs to offer reasonable evidence for those type of things. Prior to saying that um, you know, apologists or need to rebut this claim, there needs to be some positive evidence offered for it, which they've uh, failed to do. Uh, we're gonna move now to the last of uh, the eight natural witnesses. Um, and I tried to spread out our, our discussion of evidence and uh, law, burden of proof, that kind of thing. But um, as we end the last of our uh, discussion of the direct evidence, I just want to make this really clear that um, there's two types of evidence when you, when you go to court, direct and cir circumstantial. So one, if believed, directly proves a fact. The other allows for a fact to be inferred. So what do we mean by that? Direct evidence, if believed, proves the exi existence of the fact in issue without inference or presumption. So it's basic on usually on witnesses, right? Sometimes nowadays it's a, a videotape, um, so some sort of recording of an event, um, but it's ba uh, based on a witness's personal knowledge or observation of the fact. So an example, uh, say in a murder case, a witness personally saw the defendant stab the victim, that's direct evidence that that stabbing took place. If you believe that witness, then it proves the fact at hand. So whether or not you actually believe or can impeach the witnesses, which we've tried to do, um, that actually is a, it's a separate issue, right? The, it doesn't change the fact that um, the nature of the evidence is direct. Circumstantial, sometimes what's called indirect evidence, is direct evidence of a fact which reasonably infers the existence or non-existence of another fact, right? So now you're starting, you have to, you have to step down in your argument. So, it is not direct observation of the fact that is in dispute. So what would be an example of, of this in, in our murder case? The witness didn't see the stabbing. Instead, the witness saw the defendant go into the house carrying a knife, uh, heard a scream inside the house, saw the defendant run away, not carrying the knife. Victim is later found inside with a knife in her back. The reasonable inference, right, is the defendant stabbed the victim. Whether that fact is true will determine the defendant is guilty, right? So notice in the above that there, no one actually saw the act. What they're seeing is um, things that lead to that conclusion. A man running out of the house, they're going in. That's circumstantial evidence. So it's as a collection of facts that when we consider it together, we use to infer something, okay? So what we've been dealing with um, in terms of LDS truth claims is very simple. And this is really the, the only thing that we have as truth claims in the LDS Church. Metal plates were possessed by Joseph Smith. These plates contained authentic ancient text that has been translated for our benefit. You notice there's nothing here about prophets being infallible in terms of their moral character or in terms of uh, church's policy or even doctrine um, that 
most of what we will take on as criticisms um, aren't actually our truth claims. Now, the things that grow out of this um, are things like, right, the LDS Church has authority to do certain things, to perform certain ordinances, and that, generally speaking, the, the leadership um, has some sort of doctrinal authority, but even that, we know, has ups and downs and rights and wrongs. So when we talk about what is our LDS truth claim, this is, this is really all that it is. So we've been dealing with direct evidence. This is another uh, direct evidence. These eight men are direct evidence for this fact. So uh, just uh, simplifying their testimony, they said they have seen and hefted, they did handle with their hands, they saw the engravings, and we lie not. Who are these men? Um, mostly the Whitmer family. Hiram Page ends up being a, a, a son and brother-in-law of the Whitmers. And then some of the Smith family, uh, Joseph's dad, his brother, and his two brothers, older and younger. Now we get to Missouri. Most of the witnesses, uh, they deal with a lot of uh, persecution. So John Coral records that they took Christian Whitmer and pointed their guns at him and threatened to kill him if he didn't tell them where the brethren were. According, uh, the enemy had thrown down 10 or 12 houses and nearly whipped some to death among, those, among whom was Hiram Page. So they deal with a lot of uh, persecution there. Um, earlier that year, John Whitmer and as, had joined other leaders offering themselves as hostages to try and stop this abuse. Christian dies in 1835 and Peter dies in 1836. So they're pretty quick actually to, um, to die. According to Oliver Cowdery, he says, By many in this church, our brothers uh, were personally known. They were the first to embrace the new covenant on hearing it and during a constant scene of persecution and perplexity to the last moments maintain its truth. They were both included in the list of eight witnesses in the Book of Mormon, and though they have departed, it is with great satisfaction that we reflect that they proclaim their last moments, the certainty of their former testimony. May all who read remember the fact that the Lord has given men a witness of himself in the last days and that they have faithfully declared it till called away. They were called away pretty early. Now we get into uh, the excommunication and, and uh, uh, leaving of the church. John Whitmer, we've talked about this story before. John Whitmer and W.W. W. Feltz had taken personal title to, uh, to the land in, in Far West. Um, there was a lot of resentment and, and um, criticism of that. Uh, John declined to be called to account economically or personally. He didn't appear at any of, any of the high council trials and was excommunicated March 10th of 1838. Um, he was also affected by the failure of the Kirtland Bank and really s suffered in uh, trust of Joseph. Uh, he was followed by David one month later. Hiram Page and Jacob Whitmer uh, just kind of took sides and, and left the church. There wasn't um, as much formal dealings with them. Really at, the, at this point we can expect John Whitmer to be his most bitter um, and he actually joins with non-Mormons and ridiculing the faith of uh, Theodore Turley. He was a business agent that stayed back in Far West to kind of handle and, and wrap up business. Um, Turley accuses of, of him of inconsistency, and, and John makes two revealing statements. One, he says, I now say I handled those plates. They were, there were fine engravings on both sides. I handled them. And then and Turley says, well, you know, why are you doubting? And he says, well, I couldn't translate them. Um, he said, I cannot read it, and I do not know whether it is true or not. So that was really at the kind of the height of his, of his, uh, of his bitterness. Uh, so despite estrangement, um, none of the eight uh, denied uh, their testimony. This is uh, Jacob Whitmer's son. My father, Jacob Whitmer, was always faithful and true to his testimony to the Book of Mormon. He confirmed it on his deathbed. Hiram Page wrote a letter to William McClellan, as to the Book of Mormon, it would be doing injustice to myself and to the work of God in the last days to say I could know a thing to be true in 1830 and know the same thing to be false in 1847. Mm. After his death in 1852, this is what Hiram Page's son wrote, I knew my father to be true and faithful to his testimony of the divinity of the Book of Mormon until the very last. Whenever he had an opportunity to bear his testimony to this effect, he would always do so. And he seemed to rejoice exceedingly in having been privileged to see the plates. So after 1856, um, John Whitmer is the sole survivor, so he outlives some people by, by decades. Um, and he has a number of in, uh, chances to reiterate his testimony. 1861, Jacob Gates, he, John, testified that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith was a prophet of the Lord. He also said he believed that Brigham Young was carrying out the doctrine and system which Joseph Smith taught, but he, Whitmer, did not believe in a man's having more than one wife. 
to William Lewis in 1877. Uh, this is nearing the end of his life, and he's a, a bit more reflective. And um, at last, he did say, wiping the tears off, that the day would come when we would all see eye to eye. Again, uh, um, in a letter of uh, Myron, a letter of Myron Bond, old father John Whitmer told me last winter, with tears in his eyes, that he knew as well as he knew he had an existence that Joseph translated the ancient writing, of, which was upon the plates, which he saw and handled, and which, as one of the scribes, he helped to copy as the words fell from Joseph's lips by supernatural almighty power. Six months before his death, uh, he preaches or teaches at a, a Sunday morning service. This is reported in a local newspaper, the Kingston Sentinel. Mr. Whitmer is considered a truthful, honest, and law-abiding citizen by this community, and consequently his appointment drew out a large audience. Mr. Whitmer stated that he had often handled the identical golden plates, which Mr. Smith received from the hand of the angel. Before closing, he asked the audience if they would take the Book of Mormon and the Bible and compare them and to take Paul's rule to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So this is just six months before his death. Uh, how about the Smiths? Um, we know Hiram pretty well. Uh, Samuel was probably the most active early missionary. Um, and by all accounts, is kind of a, a quieter man. He would, uh, he, in fact, when he uh, would hand out copies of the Book of Mormon, he didn't necessarily say that he was Samuel Smith and kind of proclaim it. He would wait to be asked, and then he would, would testify. Um, he converted many, many people um, by his testimony. Here's a, a one account of it. In the spring of 1832, Elder Samuel H. Smith and Orson Hyde came to our neighborhood, held a few meetings. Elder Smith read the 29th chapter of Isaiah at the first meeting and delineated the circumstances of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, of which he said he was a witness. He knew his brother Joseph had the plates, for the prophet had shown them to him, and he had handled them and seen the engravings thereon. His speech was more like a narrative than a sermon. Uh, Samuel dies uh, after attempting a horseback ride uh, to try and uh, get to his brothers. Uh, and then, of course, their death. Um, uh, he dies of sickness a month later, a month after his brothers. Uh, Hiram, everyone is probably is aware of Joseph's, uh, you know, his description of, of Hiram as being without guile. Um, that was really universally known amongst, amongst the saints. John Taylor wrote, if there was... If there was an exemplary, honest, and virtuous man, if there ever was, sorry, an embodiment of all that is noble in the human form, Hiram Smith was its representative. Uh, according to uh, survivors of the uh, burner, Hiram read portions of the book more in the night before the martyrdom and bore testimony of the coming forth the next day. This is how he saw his testimony in a letter that he wrote. Um, Having given my testimony to the world of the truth of the Book of Mormon and the establishment of the kingdom of heaven these last days, and having been brought into great afflictions and distress for the same, I thought it might be strengthening to my beloved brethren to give them a, a short account of my sufferings for the truth's sake and the state of my mind and feelings while under circumstances of the most trying and afflicting nature. I had been abused and thrust into a dungeon, liberty, on account of my faith. However, I thank God that I felt a determination to die rather than deny the things which my eyes had seen, which my hands had handled, and which I had borne testimony to. Wherever my lot had been cast, and I can assure my beloved brethren that I was enabled to bear as strong a testimony when nothing but death presented itself as I ever did in my life. That was in uh, 1839. Uh, you don't see in, in even on the internet, uh, or certainly not in academic or scholarly uh, pieces, attempts to impeach the, the eight witnesses, there's a, you know, really a focus on the three based on bias. And we also, we, we just talked about, there's lots of counter examples, uh, counter evidence of bias, the hardships, the estrangement, death threats, all that. Um, inconsistent statement or character. Uh, and no responsible report from any of the eight witnesses exists denying their testimony, which would be an inconsistent statement. Uh, the one report that does pop up in, on the internet and in, in books is uh, from Thomas Ford, Governor Thomas Ford. You remember he's, uh, some would say incompetence led to the, the prophet's murder in, in uh, Carthage. Uh, he wrote in his history, it is related that the prophet made faith the condition of seeing the plates. So that after the witnesses brainwashed themselves by fasting and intense desire, Joseph opened an empty box. Mm -hmm. After exclaiming, Brother Joseph, we don't see the plates. Uh, they were answered with a tirade of divine threats unless they developed, quote, a holy and living faith. So after two more hours of, quote, fanatical prayer, at the end of which time, looking again into the box, they were now persuaded that they saw the plates. This was in History of Illinois, 
1854. Where did he get this from? Uh, according to him, men who were once in the confidence of the prophet. So uh, it's an anom anonymous informant. We're not sure where he heard this. Um, but here's the problem with this kind of thing. So uh, Harry Beardsley applies this story to the three witnesses in his Joseph Smith and his Mormon Empire. Fawn Brody narrows the story to the eight witnesses, and she also gives them an upgrade to the source. So once in the confidence of the prophet becomes Joseph's key men in her book, uh, No Man Knows My History. And she also calls it one of the most plausible descriptions of the manner in which Joseph Smith obtained these eight signatures. Later on, um, we get Edmund Wilson, who says, he actually ascribes this to the eight witnesses themselves. So though they said that at first when the box was opened, it had seemed to them to be empty till Smith had exhorted them to get down on their knees and pray for more faith. So what's happened here? We have an anonymous source to Governor Ford, which becomes Joseph's key men for Brody, which becomes the eight witnesses themselves for Wilson. Mm. And this is the kind of thing that, that you will see on the internet um, that uh, is uh, poor sourcing again, you can't source this to the, the witnesses themselves at all. Um, well, they said the handle. Yeah. So many names said handle. Handle. Yeah. Yeah. That, it, it, and even Brody says, um, if you, <laughs> she's a little bit contradictory here, but um, she goes through the Thomas Ford set to continual prayer and exercise. And then she says, um, Yet it's difficult to reconcile this explanation with the fact that these witnesses and later M and, and William Smith emphasize the size, weight, and metallic texture of the plates. And then she says, perhaps Joseph built some kind of makeshift de deception. Um, anyway, so she recognizes there's, uh, despite saying it's one of the most plausible, then she does recognize that there's uh, a real problem with the fact that they describe all that that they handle. Um, so our proposition is that the eight formal natural witnesses are reliable because they have not been uh, impeached. So again, if what, what's our direct evidence for our truth claims? The reality of the plates are tested by numerous witnesses, generally of two types, the natural, uh, including the informal natural, Emma, uh, all the other members of the Smith household that moved them. Uh, so those that heard, believed, saw the stone box, and then the supernatural shown by uh, non-mortals. So if believed, these witnesses prove LDS truth claims by, by nature of there being direct evidence. Uh, I might pause here to say that critics have offered uh, to date no direct evidence against LDS truth claims. What would they look like? Uh, it would be eyewitnesses to Joseph forging, right? He had to forge something here, so he had to... Um, I don't know, he had to go somewhere and make plates and they were heavy. So that would, that would be direct evidence against, um, or some, one of the formal informal witnesses admitting that they were in league with Joseph, admitting to this conscious fraud. Um, that would be direct evidence against uh, truth claims. Uh, to impeach direct witnesses, uh, as we've seen, requires many unreasonable propositions with lack, which lack evidence, uh, such as we just went with through with the uh, with the supposed uh, hypnosis. So we're extending our argument number one to include the formal natural witnesses. So we have a proposition A, which we went through the, the first session, at least 14 informal witnesses claim that he or she felt the plates weighing between 40, 60 pounds, lifted them or were shown the plates by angels. Many non-converts and non-friends tried to steal or bargain for the plates. We also covered that in, in session one. Uh, the Martin Harris proposition, Martin Harris's half century long testimony of the angel and plates is reliable. Oliver Cowdery's testimony of the angel and plates, as well as the receipt of divine authority in three separate visions, are reliable. That's we went through two sessions ago, the Oliver Cowdery proposition. E, last week, David Whitmer's testimony of the angel and plates is reliable. F, eight men testified of seeing, lifting, inspecting the plates, and their testimonies are reliable. We just went through the FW proposition. And G, that we don't have any direct evidence against the proposed fact that Joseph possessed plates of ancient design and received divine authority. Therefore, our conclusion is that it is reasonable or probable that Joseph Smith, in fact, uh, possessed the plates and received divine authority, as he and Oliver claimed. If we extend our argument to absurdity or improbability to include uh, the natural eight natural formal witnesses, uh, we again propose that Joseph Smith is a fraud by metallurgical fraud, so he creates 
some sort of plates and uh, potentially mass hypnosis or hallucination. So to accomplish this, he has to do all of these things. First, he has to create fake metal plates weighing between 40 and 60 pounds with expert carvings because he has to dupe 22 natural witnesses. He's got to be confident enough in his fraud to copy those characters, seek out the best scholars of the day to try and get them translated. Uh, they have to be believed by scholars like Mitchell and Anton. E, his meteorological fraud is so convincing that all eight formal natural witnesses believe it until death, despite estrangement and persecution. That's what we went through uh, just today. F, Joseph Smith has to induce hypnotic trance for Oliver and David, and then separately for Martin Harris of identical visions. Joseph Smith has to induce hypnotic trance without, pre with his, without his presence for Mary Whitmer, Zyra Pulsifer, and Her Harrison Burgess, and Luke Johnson, at least, that we have record of. He has to induce complex audiovisual visions that are specific and experienced in the same manner, which is in contravention of known hypnotherapy. So we've never had evidence of this being done before. He has to induce these hypnotic trances prior to the rise of hypnotic research in the 1840s and in a location being rural New York where there's no evidence of such knowledge existed. He may have even done so unknowingly, apparently, according to some. Um, the hallucinations have to be so effective for Martin, Oliver, David, Mary, that, and others that endures for the rest of their lives, despite, despite no relationship and much ridicule. Uh, he has to further induce visions of John the Baptist for Oliver Cowdery, um, Peter, James, and John for he and Oliver Cowdery, and Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and Elias for Oliver Cowdery. That those visions have to be, and hallucinations have to be so effective that endures for decades despite no relationship and large potential gains for denial. Oh, it is highly improbable that Joseph Smith could have accomplished all of those things. Uh, therefore, we've reasoned to, not absurdity, but unreasonability, that it's probable that he possessed the plates. Um, as you can see, it just gets longer and longer, and that's just with the, the, direct, uh, the direct evidence. Did anybody say that it's uh, Satan? Most of our, I, I, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, on right. bounds of the internet, you can get that, but most, uh, Oh, uh, the, the question is, do, do some people propose that it's Satan? Um, you'll get some, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to typecast uh, people of other faiths, but from certain Christian groups, yes. Um, but most of our critics are, are not, or, well, they, we have a group of critics that are, come from a more evangelical, U, just U.S. evangelical background. And then we have a group that are the natural, the naturalists that don't believe in anything supernatural, Brody, Vogel, etc. So that group would never bring Satan into it because they don't believe in that. Um, some do, but um, you know, then you have to say that Satan produces a book that's like believe in Jesus and repent and you know do all these things. So it's hard. Um, 